This is Patrick Russell. I'm interviewing Claude Dunn for the first time. This interview is taking place at Fayetteville, North Carolina on October the 21st, 2017. Uh, this interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. So Claude, uh, tell me, where, when were you born? Uh, 13 May 1944. All right, and where were you born? Corpus Christi, Texas at the Naval Base. My dad was a lieutenant commander. All right, what was the name of your father? Sidney Bergen Dunn. All right, and just briefly describe your hometown as you know it when you were growing up. How was it? Well, it was a little town. It was called Georgetown, Texas. And it was, at that time, it was about 4,000 people. Uh, my grandfather, Poppy, he was the uh, professor of uh, the Georgetown University, and so he was a well-respected man of German descent. And uh, how big was your family? Uh, well, I had a brother, and I had, uh, there was five, uh, well, four uncles, and I had, uh, of course, four aunts. Okay. And... Uh, and you went to high school? Yes, sir. I uh, uh, went to high school in Las Vegas, Las Vegas Nevada, because we moved out there. And, uh, and then uh, my mother thought I was going to hell in the handbag, so she said, told me that I was going to uh, military school. And so I went uh, first year, I think I was in uh, ninth grade, and I went to... Uh, Elsinore Naval Military Academy, Elsinore, California. And then uh, the next year I went to New Mexico Military Institute, Roger Stu uh, <laughs> forget. I went to New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell, New Mexico. And one of the highlights of my life at that time is uh, two years later I was the first sergeant of F Company and I got I got a bunch of football jocks in, one of them named was Roger Staubach. And so I became his first sergeant. And uh, I used to run him over to the uh, little uh, soda shop we had on post every Friday night, and I made him get me a Coke and a pack of Juicy Fruit Gums for a Friday night movie in the auditorium. But the problem with doing things like that is sometimes they come back on you. So. As he, as he was in college, they only have to stay six months as a rep, and they can get promoted after that. And, so, and he was such a great football player that they promoted him to first lieutenant and made him my company commander. So I was doing the same thing for him that he made me, or that I made him do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And... Um did you, uh, so you graduated from high school? Yes, sir. All right, and did you go off to college? I, I went to the same school in Mexico, I went to I went two years of college there. All right, and what did you study there? It was just general, just okay. two years of college, you know, math, history, same stuff. All right, and um, did you end up getting a degree? No, I, I didn't. I didn't get a degree. All right. But uh, after that, after that, it was you know I was sort of getting restless. I was 19. I wanted to do something, you know. So that's when I went to the recruiters. All right. What year was that? 1964. All right. So, and um, what do you think that your father's military service influenced you to follow his path? No, that didn't have any anything to do with it. Uh, it was being in the Mexico Military Institute. Uh, of course, I was in ROTC. You know, we fired every weapon that the Army had during those years, and so, and I learned uh, oh so much about the infantry. And so, when I went to the uh, Army, I knew I was going to be infantry. I didn't know I was going to be airborne, but I knew I was going to be infantry. Okay. So you went and you enlisted. Yes, sir. All right, and uh, what happened? So you enlisted, and tell me what what happens next. Well, I I enlisted, and I enlisted infantry 
airborne unassigned. So I went through basic uh, and AIT at Fort Ord, California, and then uh, jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia for three weeks. And of course, at the end of it, they they ask you, you know, about a dream sheet, you know, where do you want to go, you know, you dream about it, you won't get it. But, uh, so I, I put down first choice, Germany. I thought I wanted to see part of the world. And of course everybody, you know, were putting down uh, the 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Bragg, the 101st, Fort Campbell, and the 173rd, and, uh, and lo and behold, I got Germany and went to the 509th Airborne, uh, mechanized them. So there I was. <laughs> All right. And what year was this now? Uh, this was probably April 64 now. Okay. And how was, if you could, briefly describe your airborne training? Oh, at Fort Benning? Mm -hmm. Oh, sh well, it was old dark 30 every morning getting up. And uh, by 5, you were doing PT in the uh, uh, sawdust pits. And after you did at least an hour of that stuff, and they took you on three and five mile runs with combat boots. There were no running shoes. And uh, this was every day. And then of course during the day in your, your, your uh, parachute train, they were dropping you for minor infractions. Dropping you means drop, give me 10 push-ups. And uh, this went on all day. And, and I, I thought I'd push Georgia into the ocean. Uh, I had done that stuff so many times, but uh, but we would we would practice uh, jumping out of the out of a tail of an airplane, you know, and sort of realism. And then we got on the swing land trainer, and they'd shift it up and down like this, and then they'd drop you, and you'd have to do a parachute landing fall to the left or to the right or forward or backwards, and, uh, and of course more push-ups. <laughs> Do you remember uh, some of your commanding officers from that time period? No, but I remember a, a black hat instructor. Uh, he, I don't know, remember his name, but he was the first sergeant. And uh, we're standing there in the dark. I mean, nobody could see anybody. And uh, he, he said, we all had numbers on our helmets. And mine was 134. And uh, I was, I, you know, at attention, you know, your eyes are straight ahead. And I was, I was sort of looking around, and, and this guy was up and he was 100 feet from me. And he, it was dark, pitch dark, and he says, one, three, four, drop, you're looking around. So I think he just picked my number out of the air, but of course I was looking around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're in the Army. Yes. You're in the Airborne now. You're in Germany. What are you doing in Germany in 1964? Well, I was, I was first, first when I first got there. Uh, I was going to be in an infantry squad, and uh, the first sergeant was an old World War II paratrooper, and he he looked at my uh, 201 file and he says, he says, can you type some? I said, yes, sir. He says, mess hall. I'm not mess hall. Uh, mechanic uh, where, they, where they had to fill out all the forms. So I went down to the, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Well, the motor pool. And so I was a, a typist down there in the motor pool, taking care of records and everything. I did that for about five months, and then the first sergeant said, no, nah, he's not gonna stay there, we need infantry. So he pulled me back out, and. Uh, Put me as a as a one one three mechanized uh, driver. It it was a uh, armored track vehicle that carried about eleven guys, and so I was a driver for the lieutenant. Okay. And uh, boy, it was cold over there, and those things were uh, aluminum, so they didn't hold any heat, and there were no heaters. And uh, the, the problem with those vehicles was that it was a uh, it was powered by gas, and one armor-piercing round would go straight through that vehicle, through the gas tank, set it on fire, and blow everybody up in it. And the the engine was a 283 Detroit Chrysler uh, V8, and they were just oh, when they got cold, it was just horrendous to get them started. And so, 
when I left there in 67, they just got diesel engines into them so there wouldn't be as many fires. And where were you stationed in Germany? Uh, Mainz, Germany. It's uh, near, uh, uh, about maybe 50 miles from uh, Frankfurt. And uh, what type of equipment or weapons were you qualified to use? Well, well, that's sort of a double-edged question because I had fired everything that the Army had up to that time. Uh, and the only thing new that they had that I hadn't fired was the, uh, the uh, M14. And then when we got to uh, Germany, they had the, the M16. So those were two weapons I hadn't fired yet. Okay. But I had fired everything from the old Browning 1919 A2 and A6, the BAR, the carbine, M1, uh, a bunch of them I can't remember, but I had fired them all. So all the, all the small, small arms, yep. Small arms for the infantry. Okay. And what type of training were you doing while in Germany? Oh, well, the, like I said, the problem with, with this airborne mechanized thing was, yes, we could jump out of airplanes and pull a, uh, an airborne maneuver, but most of the time we were, we were in tracks, you know, in these, these uh, personnel carriers. And so we, we were doing more armored personnel carrier stuff than, than airborne, uh, jumping out of planes, you know, and just doing infantry operations. And so, I mean, we did all of them, but it, it was, seemed like, it, to me, it was more uh, out of the uh, mechanized port part of it instead of the airborne. And you were primarily there as a deterrent to the Soviet Union? Right, yeah, right. We, we, we were there, the airborne mechanized had two roles. If they came across real fast, we acted as airborne, they would drop us. If they came across slowly, then we would act as mechanized. But we, were, we weren't far from the Fulda Gap, and that was where they would come across. But so we, I guess that's why they had us uh, mechanized and airborne. All right, and at this point, what is your rank? Uh, well, I, I made PFC, uh, when I, I guess six months after I've been there now, I made uh, Spec 4, and then I was moved from regular infantry to the 106 Corps Rifle, where my platoon sergeant got me ready for use of our competition. And uh, we worked on this for about nine months, and uh, I became the best in use for I outshot everybody in all of Germany, and uh, they promoted me to Bucksart after two years and nine months. Okay. And, uh... And we were still doing KP at that time, okay, when there was KP. <laughs> and what did you do uh, next in terms from Germany? Where did you go? Well, after, after three years, they, uh, they sent me back, well, they sent me to Fort Bragg. And uh, I got back, to, I got to Fort Bragg, and uh, the third brigade was gone. They were up in uh, Chicago, uh, quelling the Chicago riots. And so there wasn't a whole lot of people left in the brigade. So I had, uh, I was assigned to the first of the 325, the, the old paraglide unit. And uh, we trained on, on the 106 exclusively. All right, and so at this point you're in the 82nd Airborne? Right. And in the 50? Uh, 325. 325, okay. Yeah, first, first Battalion 325. Okay. A Company. All right. All right, and how long did you stay in Fort Bragg? Well, the 3rd Brigade came back from, from uh, Chicago uh, after about three months, and uh, then everybody, everything was normal. And then about seven months later, uh, General Westmoreland uh, 
called General Sykes, the 82nd commander, and said, you know, I want the 82nd in Vietnam. And General Sykes told him, he said, he says, Will, he said, I don't have enough people in the division to give you. And so he said, I will strip the division and I can send you one brigade and that's it. And he stripped the division. There was nobody left, nobody. And uh, they even sent the guys who had just came back from Vietnam right back over there. And one of my good buddies, Phil, he, he was one of those guys. All right. And, yeah. And is this when you eventually made your way to Vietnam? Oh yeah, we activated. I, I was moved from the 325 to headquarters uh, 508, and uh, that's where I met Phil, and uh, he had already been to Vietnam, thank God for me, and uh, so I was assigned to him, and uh, although I had more time and great time and service, he had already been there, and he had the experience, which I didn't mind at all. He could be in charge, that's fine, and uh, we went together to Vietnam, and we were best of buds. All right, what's Phil's name? So, Phil Cronin. Okay. And um, so at this point, you're in the 1505. First, the 508. 508. Yep. And what year is this now? 1968. All right. And what are you, what's your rank now? Still still a Buxar. Okay. And Phil was what? Buxar. All right. And you get deployed to... Vietnam. Vietnam. Where do you go? Uh, well, Jim, uh, of course, uh, uh, President Johnson came down with about 17 four-star generals, and they all trooped the line, came down, shook their hands, and all that kind of stuff. And then we uh, got back on the 141 star lifters and uh, flew over to Vietnam. And uh, we stopped in uh, Alaska and refueled and on to Vietnam. And, uh, we, we were supposed to land at Wei Fu Bai, and what happened was the the sixty and sixty eight Kaesan got attacked, and they were on the verge of being destroyed, and uh, they diverted every airplane in Vietnam to to Kaesan. So we landed instead of landing in uh, Wei Fu Bai, we had to land in Chu Lai. So in Chu Lai. Uh, we couldn't get any aircraft, like I said, because they were diverted. So we went, to, or uh, Colonel Bowling went to this support company and requisitioned 760 deuce and a half trucks to truck us from Chula to Wei Fu Bai, which was a two day run. And so we checked, we convoyed from Chula uh, through to uh, Da Nang, Rocket City. and. In through that route was called the High Van Pass, and when we were going through it, they were taking sniper shots at us, and of course, you know, trying to kill us. We went through there, and uh, we turned our big 106 guns on and let a few beehive rounds go out, and that stopped that. And then we stayed overnight at uh, Rocket City, Da Nang, and then we moved on up to Chu Lai the, uh, the next day, got there about 3 4 o'clock. That's where the 101st was, and the 101st Airborne, and we were, we were under operational control of them. All right. And at this point, what's your role? What are you doing? I'm still gunning on my uh, 106 Recoilless Rifle, and we were, uh, Colonel Bowling, well, since we had been uh, rerouted, the 101st didn't know we were coming. So when we got there, uh, Colonel Bowling went to the Chief of Staff of the 101st team. He said, uh, he said, my name is uh, William Bowling. And he says, I'm from the 82nd Airborne Division. He said, well, where did you come from? I said, I came from the States. And he says, he says, nobody told me you were coming. He said, well, we're here. And he says, I want to, he said, I want to see the map of wh what your area is. And so they they took him in and showed him the area, and he said, "Where where is all the enemy?" He said, "Well, they're all over." He said, "No, the, the concentration of the enemy." He said, "I want where all the enemy is, where the most of the enemy is. That's where my unit's going to be." 
And so he, he said, all right, Colonel. So he put us right in the middle of uh, the 5th NVA uh, regiments. And uh, within, well, on LZ Birmingham, and then within a month we were, we did some major battles, three major battles. Lazy W and the, the Three Vills and a couple other things. And it was, it was the 505, the first 505, second 505, and the first 508 in these battles. All right, and just describe the purpose of your 106 rec recoilless rifle. Oh. What do you what do you employ it for? Well, uh, originally the the 106 recoilless rifle was used to uh, stop tanks, to blow up bunkers and bust bunkers, bust you know bunker buster. But then they developed the beehive round for it, and uh, which was great for jungle fighting, and uh, it was packed with 8,000 flechette rounds, little steel darts about that long, and uh, you didn't have to be a good shot, and it went through the jungles, and you didn't have to really see the enemy, and it was, that, that beehive was one of the most dangerous things I ever saw. And how big is the 106 recoilless rifle? It's about, uh, I'd say 12, 13 feet long, and uh, it fires uh, a sh sh round shell about like this, and uh, it's, I would say it's about almost three feet long. It's really a long shell, and it has a nose cone on the front of it, and it is graduated in meters, and you could turn, you press in on the nose cone and turn it, and you can go from 50 to 100 to 150 to 200, 253, all the way up to 1,100 meters. And that, what that does is, if you have an enemy out at 700, and he's spread out, and you send a beehive round out there, then you can, like if he's at 700, then you set it at six. So, and it counts revolutions and turns, and it knows where it is in relation to the ground. So when it gets out to uh, 600, the shape charge behind the steel darts fires and just spreads them out like that. And, uh, and the reason they call it beehive is when that, when that shape charge shoots those steel darts out, it goes Vroom. It sounds like a beehive. Hmm. And very deadly. So tell me a cup about a couple of these uh, campaigns you were in. You mentioned that there were three major battles. Well, we were, the 82nd was in eight uh, major campaigns of Caratan 1 and 2, and they had different names for them. I don't remember them all now. I, I personally was in five major campaigns, and some other people were in seven, eight. But uh, I was in Caratan, I remember I was in Caratan 1 and 2, but that's where we went now. The, that's where the 68 Tet Offensive was, uh, the Way Tet Offensive. And it was us, the 101st and uh, uh, another unit, and we went from house to house, clearing houses, and it was really dangerous. And, but my saving grace was I stayed back, back from it with the 106, and they would call me on the radio and they'd say, look out such and such, they'd give me a grid coordinate, and I'd look at it and they'd say, you see the house at such and such and such and such? i say, yeah. He says, put one through the front door. So I, I put one of the bunker busters right through the front door, and it would just lift these mud huts up about three feet, and then they just disappeared. And so if there was one, anybody hiding in there, they were gone. Okay. And um, what you're, you mentioned, uh, Philip Cronin, what's he doing at this time? <laughs> He's doing the same thing okay. on another gun. Yeah, we, they, they were calling all of us, you know. It, everybody, you know, going from house to house is really dangerous because they booby trapped everything. And I mean everything. And if you open the door, it would blow up. So they, we were really on call. Uh, for that way, 60 Tet, 68 Tet offensive. So we we blew up a lot of buildings. 
blew up a lot of buildings. And um, how do you feel about Vietnam in terms of the U.S. entry into it and the prosecution of the war? You know, I didn't think much about that. Uh, I was a soldier. They told me where to go, what to do. I did it. You know, I, I, I was a man that took orders. You know, and, and uh, what what my country said, or what the people above me appointed said, I did. And uh, I didn't have I didn't have any sorts of feeling politically one way or the other. You know, it, all I wanted to do was stop communism. Man, that was it. So I didn't have much of an opinion on it. And um, how how many tours in Vietnam did you end up doing? Oh, one, thank you. That's all I needed. All right. One. Just I was lucky. I only had to do one. And how long was it? It was a year. One year. Yeah, we got there in uh, we got there in uh, February, and I went home in February. And Phil had to do two. Well, one and a half. Mm -hmm. So besides the Tet Offensive, do you remember any other notable actions that you were involved in? Oh yeah. Uh, well, we stayed up north, which is where the uh, infiltration was coming from. You know, the, all, the, uh, all the enemy was coming through all those passes and everything. And so we stayed up there oh, six months, and then we got the uh, order to move all the way down south to Saigon and uh, we started going into Saigon we moved it was called Firebase Hardcore we moved in there and, and Camp Red Ball was down there and uh, when I got down there uh, Saigon was you know rice paddies and water swamps and oh just nasty stuff and uh, the 106 Corvo's rifle could, it didn't float so we really couldn't take it anywhere near the swamps you know it gets stuck in the sink and so uh, they said okay well Sergeant Dunn you, you're going back to the infantry you know humping so I went I went back to carrying a hundred pound rucksack every day and uh, well, I didn't look forward to that. <laughs> you mentioned an interesting thing. How do you transport the 106 recoilless rifle? Well, we to get it over there, you know, we we put it, uh, the C-141 Starlifter at that time held eight Jeeps. So we took eight on one plane and uh, uh, eight on another plane. But in Vietnam, you know, we used the roads uh, to get it to wherever we were going. and. Now and when we, when I, when I uh, got changed to the infantry, they took my jeep and used it as a ground defensive weapon, so they could sit there uh, with the uh, encirclement of the camp and put 106s all around it and spread beehive and anybody wants to attack it, they were they were coming for a world of hurt, and so that's what they used some of the guns for, and others they made. Uh, you know, you've seen Rat Patrol in the old days, you know, with a, with a mounted machine gun on. Well, they, they took the gun off, used it as a defensive weapon, and then put a machine gun on and they'd run the roads uh, looking for the enemy. But that's, that's what it was. <laughs> All right, so now you're in Saigon and now you're back into the normal infantry. And what are you doing? Well, for a little while, there was a place called the Hock Mon Bridge, and it was uh, it was just a wasn't a long bridge, but it was an important bridge because the uh, enemy up to that time was using it to bring supplies and people and everything across. Well, they put us at the Hock Mon Bridge, and so we had we had four 106s at the Hock Mon Bridge, and we had uh, probably a, a half a platoon of guys, you know, like twenty guys there. Uh, to stop anybody from coming over there. And we guarded the Hockmon Bridge, I guess, for a couple of months. And then uh, they decided to, uh, quote, this is the time of pacification. And 
I didn't know what they were talking about. I said, I, I said, I said well, I said, uh, Sergeant, I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to some village, and he said, we're going to pacify. And I said, exactly, what does that mean? And he says, he says, well, he says, in essence, he says, we're going out to this village, we're going to surround it, put our, encircle the whole place with troops, and deny access to the enemies and, and the uh, chiefs who would come around and collect money from the poor people and steal their grain and harvest and rice stuff. And we were, we were there to let them lead a normal life. So that's pacify. So I, I didn't, I, I understand, I understood the concept, I just didn't like the word. And what year was this? Uh, that was 69. Um, so this is towards the end of your tour? Right. I was getting toward the end. Okay. And where's the, you said the Hockman Bridge, where's that? Uh, well, the Hockman Bridge was probably about 40 miles outside of Saigon. And, uh, and these, well, this village, I, I can't even, I can't even remember the name, but I can tell you that we got on the LST landing craft, and that was one of the few things that stuck out in my mind was that LST landing craft. I had never seen anything like it. And you got in it and put 50, 60 guys in it, and it closed this giant ramp, and we went all around these uh, river these rivers, oh, just millions of rivers in Vietnam, and and then wind up at this village, you know, and uh, the the second part of my tour, the first part I could tell you everything that happened, every day, what are, what happened, I could tell you all the things that happened, and when I got down to the second part of my tour, I get I don't know what my mind just sort of blanked out everything and I I don't remember a lot about the uh, the second part of my tour except one day blended into another and it was just boring and I, I just seemed to shut it off and the only things that made that I can remember now we got into a couple of firefights uh, and I was on patrol in the middle of the street one day just walking down the street and I was I, I guess I was in the thousand yard stare and all of a sudden this dog, blonde dog about like this, came screaming around the corner just yelling and uh, like he was being tortured and uh, I, I watched him go by and I thought geez what's wrong, what's wrong with him and then all of a sudden this Vietnamese around the corner and just almost knocked me down, scared me. And uh, I, I thought, what's going on? And then I, then I heard that I heard the M16, his the Vietnamese M16, pow, pow, pow. And of course, I heard the dog yelp, and I said, oh, jeez. Anyway, he shot the dog, and uh, he went and picked him up. And I was watching this unfold. It was just surreal. And he walked over and he put the dog in a fire and I said, oh man. And he let him sizzle for about two minutes. He turned him over and sizzled, turned him over, sizzled, turned him over, sizzled. And then I realized what he was doing. He's burning the hair off. And I thought, he's, I didn't know they ate dogs, but they did. And uh, it, that's one of the things that stuck out in my mind in the second, second part of my uh, tour. And uh, the other the other surreal things when I was back up north, uh, my mother had just sent me some uh, Jiffy Pop popcorn, and uh, we didn't we didn't didn't have it well we couldn't light a fire, that's what they said, and so uh, I I said well I said I may be able to fix this so I went over and got one of our standard issue Claymore mines and what you're unauthorized to do, but I broke it open and got the uh, C4 explosive out of it. And uh, it burns at 2,000 degrees. It won't blow up if you set it on fire. So I took a little ball of it, put it on the ground, set it on fire, 
and I was sitting there popping jippy pop popcorn. And that's where it gets really surreal. All of a sudden, an, an old A8 Sky Raider prop job, World War II stuff, and it carries one bomb, 500 pound, and, and the Vietnamese Army had it, Vietnamese Air Force, and he came down and he was bombing the enemy. And I'm sitting there popping popcorn watching this, and I was thinking, you know, there's something wrong with this. And I, I, I just, and to this day, I can't put my finger on what it was, and I, it, it just wasn't real. You know, I'm sitting there in the middle of the jungle, popping home Jiffy Pop popcorn over a explosive, watching a World War II plane drop bombs on some Vietnamese. And there, and there must have been four or five planes because they just kept coming. You know, about every ten minutes they'd come down and drop a plane. But and by that time, it we. The Jiffy Pop had popped up, you know, like that, and I put in, threw some salt on it, and we were sitting there eating popcorn, watching this. It, it, it was like watching a movie, but it was real. And that was the other, the other thing that really stuck out in my mind for, for all these years, was those two things, the dog and the popcorn. <laughs> How old were you then? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. And I was... And I was the old, I was one of the old guys because I had kids 17, 18, uh, 20, 21. One of my best friends uh, uh, was, he was, he was 17 when we left Bragg and 18 in Vietnam, turned 18 in Vietnam. And he and I were, we were like that the rest of the tour. and. Today he's living in South Carolina. He's dying of COPD, and I hooked up with him 40 years later. Uh, I had left messages all over the place for him, and finally, you know, I, I get an email that says, "Hey, Sarge, you found me," and so I, I immediately got in my car and drove down to Charleston and saw him. And uh, he he was in the first stages of COPD but he wouldn't quit smoking. So I had a little talk with him, and he says, Sarge, he says, I'm not going to do it. He says, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do, and I'm going out what I want to do. So I never talked to him about it. Again. But uh, last year, and of course, I went to see him twice a year. And then last year, he told me, he says, Sarge, he said, uh, don't come down anymore. You know, you're starting to look bad. And he says, I don't want you to remember me this way. So I had to stop going out and seeing him, which killed him. But uh, he was he was a hell of a soldier, hell of a soldier. What was his name? Uh, George Gibbs. And George, George, he, he, he didn't like to be called George. Well, I mean, I didn't call him George anyway. I called him Gibbs. That was my habit of being a sergeant. You know, you, you call the name tag, Right there, it says last name, Dunn, Gibbs, Cologne, whatever. But so my mindset for so many years, you know, is, is their last name. And I said, Gibbs, come here. You know, and uh, he liked his middle name, Brad. And so it was sort of a, sort of a weird deal, man, you know. He liked Brad, uh, and I call him Gibbs, you know. So, but he was. Good man, real good man. You mentioned the thousand yard stare. Um, have, did you, have you seen that a lot in, in Vietnam? Oh, yes. So, yeah. Well, that's, I got in it. It was just, you, you just sort of zone out for some reason. I mean, and, and you just, when you look at it, he's, he's seen too much combat, he hadn't had enough sleep, nothing to eat. And everything's weighing on him, and he just stares straight ahead. He just, you can say something to him, they're not even there. They're not home. I, and I got in there a couple of times. Uh, you know, you just get to the point where, jeez, you know, the hell with this. 
and you and you just sort of zone in. And, but you know, I couldn't I couldn't do it long because I, I had people I had to look at. And which which I was most proud of is every guy who came in my platoon made it home. Every one of them made it home. So I was ecstatic about that. And I met four or five of them in uh, Houston, Texas when we had the 40th reunion. And they come running down all, it's hard to know, it's hard to know, it's hard to know. And I turned around and it, I didn't even recognize them. I didn't know who they were. Hey, Sarge Dunn, do you, do you remember me? I'm so-and-so uh, and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and, -so. and I, I, I said yes, but I really didn't remember them. Yeah, you, you trained us on the 106 and that and that. And, uh, and so I, I said, well, how'd you guys do? He said, everybody went home, you know. I said, well, he said, oh, he said, I said, well, did you wind up with anything, you know, medals? He said, oh, God, he said, I got two bronze star on the V. Uh, you remember so-and-so, he got a silver star. He, he said, after all that training you did he, with us, he said, we were experts. You know, nobody could touch us. And apparently they, they all did great, you know. So I was happy. You know, everybody made it home. And, and, and when I got the seventh highest award when I retired, uh, the seventh highest award that America gives, which is called the Legion of Merit, in that Legion of Merit in the write-up, it says, uh, one notable achievement for Sergeant Dunn was that everyone in his platoon survived and went home. So I was happy about that. Well, I was going to ask you next, did you receive any any medals or awards? So oh. tell me about some of those. Oh, well, I got, uh, well, the, after 33 years, and which was just, and the, and the best thing, I, I mean, receiving a medal was fine. That was great. And it's a high award. But the best part of it was Colonel Carpenter, my battalion commander in Vietnam, and Major General Bowling, the commander, both came to my retirement. And that, to me, was worth its weight in gold. And, and uh, uh, General Bowling awarded me the uh, Army Commendation Medal, and I saved the big medal for my hero, Colonel Carpenter. And uh, he awarded me the uh, Legion of, it, well, it was funny, he, he took it and he, he leaned forward, he said, he said, it is an extreme pleasure to give this to you, Sergeant Dunn. And he kissed it and then put it on me, put, put it on me. And you, you got to know where Colonel Carpenter came from. He fought in World War II as a private, all for five years. And then he came home and he stayed in college. He was ROTC, infantry, and graduated in 51. They commissioned him, sent him right back to war. So this, now, that, that was his second war. And then he stayed in, and then in 1964 they sent him to Vietnam, and he was an airborne advisor to a, uh, a brigade of paratroopers, Vietnamese paratroopers. And then he went back in 66 for another tour. And then in 68, he came with us. So he was, he was World War II, Korea, and three tours in Vietnam. Had, he had stuff from here back up to the other side and one of the greatest commanders I ever saw. And I, he, he was just something. Yep. And, I, and I kept in touch with him. I, we were re-hooked up in 1990, and we talked daily, and he came out, uh, like I said, for my retirement, and I, we talked daily, and he, he died. He only died here about two years ago. But we were, we were on the phone at least once a week. And so, besides oh, those two medals, what oh, else? Yeah, I forgot. Uh, well, yeah, I had. Well, I had. Uh, I got awarded over the years uh, uh, Army Commendations Medal. So I had five Army Commendation Medals, and I had uh, the V device. Housekeeping. Just say no. No. You don't need anything. No. Okay, sorry. So. Uh, 
I got five army commendation medals with V for valor. And v, the V stands for heroism under fire. It means you did something. <laughs> and what it was, you know, and it's written out in the thing. And then I had, uh, and I got a war, I got uh, shot up, and I uh, got the Purple Heart. They owed me two, but the paperwork got lost. And uh, I got uh, three meritorious service medals. And, and uh, what I consider, a, they they sort of give them out if when you're in that time frame, you know. I call them I was there medals, so I, I really don't consider them a big deal. Uh, but I I do have two National Defense Service medals, which uh, is everybody usually only gets one, but I but I had two, and uh, I've got three. Well, everybody who went to Vietnam with the third grade, they said got three unit common commendation medals, and they go on this side. And uh, one was the uh, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with Palm, one was the Vietnamese Civil Actions Medal, and the other one was an American award, which was the Valor Unit Award. And of course, I got my I got my jump wings and my air assault wings and my combat infantry badge, which means you were under under fire for more than 30 days before you got awarded the CIB. But yeah, I was, uh, Ms. Uh, Colonel Carpenter had two combat jumps from World War II on his master blaster wing, and he had two stars on his CIB, which means he fought in three wars. So he got three awards of the CIB, which is, which only 225 people were ever awarded the CIB three times. And if you go down to the Infantry Museum at Fort Benning, you'll see that they got a room with all their names on plaques that awarded the CIB three times. And he's, he used to tell me, he said, Sergeant Major, he said, you know, he says, I've got the Silver Star and I've got this and I've got that. He said, let me tell you my, my best. He said, what I love the most, he said, I love my CIB. With two stars. I said, well, why is that, sir? He says, because, he says, he said, I call it my PAT award. I said, P-A-T? He said, yep. He said, that's perfect attendance for all three wars. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was something. Oh, and on his master blaster wings, he's, he's got the two little stars that denotes two jumps. And in the middle, and he's got it in his wallet, and he used to flip it out and show me, he said, and, and right in the middle of the parachute, he drilled a hole. That's for the third star. And he said, he says, one of these days, he said, I'm going to get a third star on there. And he put it back in his wallet. He never did, though. <laughs> okay, so you, you spent 33 years yes, in the military. And what rank did you end up with? As high as you can go, Command Sergeant Major. All right. And did you enjoy your time as a command sergeant major? Oh yeah, oh I just loved it. I, I had some great, uh, great assignments, and I always uh, like you know they had, I had to make out the duty rosters and everything, and uh, I would assign senior people to teach classes, you know, and I, and I would assign myself classes, you know, like infantry classes, like teaching. Teach them something that they'll know and remember and can use, you know. So I signed myself classes, and which was unheard of, you know. Command sergeant majors don't do that, you know. But I did it, and I would go out with my troops on, on, uh, on maneuvers. I wanted to play, you know, and show them how it's done and keep them alive. And uh, I did all that, and uh, see, I had uh, one, two. I had two different two different units, three different units as a command sergeant major. What were they? Oh, uh, I was co I was commander of the uh, well sergeant major of the uh, maneuver training command and the first of the three nine nine and the first of the three nine seven, and they all had privates in which I liked, you know, because. Once you get up to a brigade, and then I, I, I got to be a brigade sergeant major, you're nowhere near the troops. You're nowhere near them. You, you're always running around with a full colonel, meetings, and, 
and, and that's when it gets really boring, really boring. And uh, my last assignment was a uh, uh, ROTC brigade. So me and the colonel, we were getting on airplanes and visiting colleges and talking recruiting, you know, and, and I, I mean, I liked it, but I didn't like it, you know. I mean, it was an easy job, it just, just so easy. And, uh, but I, I liked it because I was getting older and it was easy, but I didn't like it because the, the, the old command sergeant major in, in me and the infantry, you know, that's, this is just not for me. But, you know, that's just the way it is. Take the good with the bad. Did you ever deploy anywhere else besides Vietnam? No, uh, well, just, you know, just Germany. Uh, that was it. Germany and, of course, Vietnam and the States. Uh, well, you know, Fort Knox and uh, Fort, uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, Fort Orr, a few right. places. So after Vietnam, for the rest of your career, you were primarily, you were in the States, right. and you were training. Right. Getting getting the, the other troops ready to do whatever they need to do. Yes, yes. I, I officiated in, in a lot of ceremonies in the 90s, uh, getting uh, troops uh, ready that were being deployed at the time. And uh, I got called up for duty six months uh, at a whack for a couple of times at Fort Knox, so I had to take over a command sergeant major position from the, you know, from another active army unit because he had to go down uh, and train with another unit. And so I got called up twice for that. But yeah, I, I did a lot of relieving of command so that structure could go uh, train and then head on into war. Okay. So your combat um, was in Vietnam? Yes. Um, did you ever have any interaction with the Vietnamese civilians at all? Not much. I, I just I, well, number one, I didn't want to, so I didn't. I didn't push talking to them. You know, I didn't. I didn't talk to them unless unless uh, Tomb Sergeant says you know get that guy. But other than that, no, I, I left him alone. Have you heard the phrase, war is hell? Who? War is hell. Have you heard that? Oh, yes. Do you agree with it? Yeah, in the heat of the battle, you know, yeah, I agree with it. Uh, I'll tell you something funny uh, that I experienced un under fire because I was ambushed one time. And... Uh, I was under under my Jeep, and the uh, AK-47s were just going through my Jeep like Swiss cheese. And uh, what what's funny is that it's like stuff is happening in slow motion. You see stuff in slow motion, but listen, it's just it's a hundred miles an hour. I mean. But but you see it in slow motion. It, it's really it's hard to explain. But it's it's it was the weirdest thing I ever saw. We George and I were underneath the vehicle after we were ambushed, and they were just the machine guns and the AK-47 were just tearing my gun up, and the, it was going through that Jeep like Swiss cheese. I mean, it was a straight inline six engine. And let me tell you, one of those bullets went straight from the front to the back of the, of the uh, engine. I mean, it didn't have much left, but it still went through it. And so we were, and we were way down. You know, so they were, and the bullets were still maybe four inches above us, and it was just knocking off pieces of my vehicle onto us, you know. And your mind's just going a thousand thousand times a minute, but you're looking in slow motion. That's the only thing I can 
say it, you know, you're out of control. You know, there's no control. It's just chaos. Is there anything else that you witnessed or experienced that made war hell? You mentioned some surreal things. Yeah. Anything similar where you just had to take a step back and say, what am I doing here or what is that? Oh, yes. Uh, it was about, I, I'd even forgotten this story. Uh, I just not thought of it. About four, I guess it was four o'clock around there, uh, I was sitting in the in my tent and I get a call and he said, uh, Dunn, uh, get down to point so and so, I forgot what it was, and but I knew where it was and so I grabbed uh, a private and I said, uh, sit back there and gun. I'm going to drive. There was nobody else. And so uh, he was back in the gunner seat and I was driving. And then by the time we were getting down, it was starting to get dark. And uh, we were hitting the roads pretty fast. Now on these Jeeps, they used to tow in the back wheels on this, like this because of all the weight of that gun that was put on back of it. And so it sort of straightened it out like that. But the problem was, if you went around a corner real fast, that thing would come back like that. And the, they, had, they tipped over real easy. So, and of course I had, I had the windshield up. And uh, we, we, were, we were moving fast, probably faster than we should have, or I should have. And uh, we were moving around these curves like this, and all of a sudden, the thing tipped. And when it tipped, it just went off the road. And I was out, and he was out, and I woke up, and I was sandwiched underneath. The vehicle was upside down, and I was, it was laying on the top of the gun, but I was in between the seats under the gun and uh, he had he was caught in the chair and his leg was broke and uh, the on, on jeeps you just have a switch that turns on the vehicle which means you know it, it turns on the uh, uh, fuel pump it turns on electricity does everything and then you hit you know you hit the button it starts up well, the engine was stopped, but the uh, electricity was still flowing, and it was leaking gas. And I thought, oh, I'm going to burn to death. And that was one of the moments I thought, we're not going to make it out of here. We're going to burn into this thing. And it just kept clicking, and it goes, tick, tick. And that's a that's the fuel pump and it just kept just kept going kept going and I thought God and then the problem is gasoline is harmful to your skin it will burn you if you let it sit on you for for 30 40 minutes it actually burns you and so now my shoulders in it and it's starting to burn I thought man we're not gonna make it and, and then, uh, I guess it was about 20, 20 minutes later, I couldn't move, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move that jeep. And uh, you know, Willie, the, the gunner, he couldn't do anything, he was pinned. And all of a sudden I hear this, I hear a voice, and I said, help! And I have, thank God it was an American, I, I shouldn't have said help. But anyway, he said, who is that? I said, Sergeant Dunn, man, I said, I'm trapped under this damn jeep. And he says, he said, hold on, Doug. And man, all of a sudden, six guys appeared out of somewhere, and they just picked that Jeep up and turned it over and off of me. And let me, as soon as that Jeep got, let me tell you something, I ran a hundred yards to get away from that thing. Because I was, I was so scared I was gonna burn to death. 
and of course my shoulder was on fire. But of course, and of course they they took care of Willie, you know, and uh, get they, uh, the medic uh, fixed his leg up, and then we were both transported back. Uh, the reason we were called down here was because there was a big firefight going on, but we never made it. And uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's one of those moments, man, that you know you're gonna die. How did you um, feel prior to combat? You knew you were going to go on a mission. Scared. I was scared every time. I was scared every jump. You know, I mean, maybe there's people that are not afraid. You know, maybe maybe they can go into a go into a plane and jump out, and think nothing of it. You know, but me, I'm scared every jump. Not for it. Just I think I'm scared because there's so many things that can go wrong. You know. And there's things you have to look for. And so, yeah, I was scared. I was scared in combat every day. And I was scared every jump. So I, I don't know if that makes me a regular guy or normal or abnormal. But, uh, yeah, scared to death. And how often were you in combat during your tour? Oh, I think I spent out of a year maybe 150 days because you're always getting pot shot at or or uh, booby traps you know probably yeah, 100 150 days something like that and now how did you feel after combat believed <laughs> uh, I thought God I made it you know even though I was shot, I, I made it, man. I, and, and the best thing to me was in one piece. I wasn't a paraplegic, man. I had, I had all my parts. I was missing a little bit of my butt, but other than that, you know, that was fine with me. And you mentioned it, it a couple times you had that thousand yard stare. How, how long would it take for you to get one of those? It seemed like it was about after three months, you know, been in a lot of intense uh, combat and uh, long, long marches in uh, leech-infested water. And every time you got out of the, the river, you had to take off 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 leeches. And it was just time-consuming. It was irritating. And, of course, some of them got infected, you know. and. Uh, and then after that, you know, it, you just, you don't care anymore. Yeah. But I, had, I always had to be on guard of that don't care stuff. You know. Did your experience from the war impact you at all when you returned home? Oh, it was a little weird, you know. <clears throat> I, I always sat with mine. Uh, if I went in a place with one with one door I went to the back so I could watch the door and as far as this a lot of guys said well you know uh, car backfire and I jump and all oh, I don't know about that I, that never bothered me uh, but uh, and of course nighttime was sort of spooky you know because we did a lot of you know uh, night ambushes and stuff so you just, it's, it's those things, you, you just have to steel yourself against it, you know. You, you try, you say to yourself, remain calm, you know, remain calm. But you were always just that far of losing your temper. I, I was that way for years. Just something like that, just, I went ape, you know. It took a long time for that to go away. Did anything help to make it go away, or was it just time? Time, time. Uh, I think tw 20, let's see, 68, 70, yeah, probably 20, 25 years, uh, 20 years later, I think. I, I, well, it, for the first 10, I, well, when I first got home, I had nightmares. And then, Seven or eight years, they they started going away, <clears throat> and by 
20 years, I had, I had, I didn't, well, let's put it this way, I, I didn't remember if I had any, but my wife said, you know, she could tell if, if I had them, and, and I kicked her out of bed one <laughs> she didn't like that. Uh, but I think to, by about 20 years, I, I quit having nightmares, and I haven't had, I know of, for a long time. And I guess it, I also, you know, you, you also, you don't think, you try not to think about the bad stuff. And I, I believe that if you leave the bad stuff alone, then it'll leave you alone. So that, that was my, my way of getting rid of it. Is there anything that still affects you today? Any type of things that you notice that triggers some sort of a memory or bad feeling or anything? No, not anymore. Uh, not that I can think of. I, it's all over, you know, it's all over. It's, it was 50, almost 50 years ago. You know, I just, I refuse to think about it, uh, the bad stuff. I remember all the good stuff. I tell a lot of funny stories about what had happened over there, but I, I, I'd rather not talk about the bad stuff because that's, it's just bringing it up again. And so, so I try to, try to keep it buried. But I haven't had any nightmares, so I, I must be doing pretty good. What do you think the percentage of good stuff versus bad stuff is that you had in your head? Well, you know, I had a lot of good experiences over there. I mean, funny, a lot of funny things happened, you know, and, and surreal things, you know. And uh, I think they sort of averaged out, you know. That's the way I think it. 50-50? Yeah, about 50-50. Is there anything you would like to tell future generations about your experience in Vietnam? Well, I was talking to I was talking to some young paratroopers and uh, and and they, I said, "Well, you guys been deployed?" And they said, "No, but we're going to be deployed pretty soon." And they and they asked me, they said, well, "Were you scared?" I, said, I told them, "Man, heck yeah, I was scared." And I said, "You're going to be scared too, man." I said, "But let me tell you something." You being trained by the 82nd and you're in the 508, you're the best unit there. I said, let me tell you something. When it hits the fan, I said, your training is going to take over. And you're going to do exactly what you've been trained to do. And, and you won't think, you won't have time to think, am I going to cut the mustard or am I going to cut and run or am I going to throw down my weapon and take off? I said, no, you're going to do exactly the way, the way you were trained to do, and you'll be fine. And then after it's all over, you'll be scared to death. But then, then you've been initiated into combat, and that's just the way it is. But that's what I told them, you know. And they seemed relieved, you know. I, I, I don't know if they hadn't talked to their platoon sergeant or whoever, but they, it, when you tell them, you know, yeah, everybody's scared, you know. And, and yeah, I said, everybody goes through this, can I cut it, you know? And I said, look, you can cut it and your training's gonna take over and it'll take you right on through. So, yeah, just remember your training, work hard, and uh, love your country. Yeah. And after that, everything will take care of itself. Well, I think that the, the young troopers probably appreciated hearing that from an old command sergeant major. Well, you know, it was funny. Last night, two of them actually come up and hugged me. I said, thanks, sergeant major. You know, I never had that happen in my life. And and one of them was from India. No more ties to me than a man in the moon. And he thought I was the greatest thing since bubblegum, like his dad or something, you know. And I mean, he came up and hugged me and, and gave me a peck on the cheek. And he said, thanks, Sergeant Major. He said, I feel a lot better. I said, hey, man, you know, it's no problem. And, then, and a couple of them did that. And boy, that just, that got to me. Well, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for your time today, Command Sergeant Major Dunn. And uh, it was really a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Call me. <laughs>